Um, I wanted to talk about the scientific method and uh, other heresies, and I've borrowed this shamelessly from a hydrologist that published a paper maybe 30, 40 years ago. Uh, and uh, basically, he, he was very good at questioning science. And uh, for that reason, in hydrology, where we have no politics, uh, he was lauded as a fantastic, wonderful, deep thinker. Uh, I don't think I need to tell you that's not necessarily my colleague's view of me, <laughs> in that we're working in you know, climate and climate uh, variability and uh, climate change. Uh, and if in any point in this talk I sound dismissive, it's because I am. <laughs> so. Anyway. Uh, a very often thing you come across in the newspapers or in the media is that uh, they say, well, you know, of course, you know, they have a flood or they have a drought, and they say, well, of course, no single event is attributable to climate change. However, this is the, exactly the kind of thing we would expect to see. Now, I would say that's completely meaningless because it's also the kind of thing we expect to see. Anyway, um, Australia has floods and has droughts. And when these things occur, no, no matter how bad they are, there's actually no evidence of carbon dioxide. And uh, they go one step further sometimes and say, well, trends in floods and droughts since 1950. We've been measuring them for about twice as long as that, if not much longer. Uh, they say, well, trends point to a carbon dioxide. There's actually no evidence in any trends either. So it's completely meaningless when you hear these kind of statements in the media. Now, I'm going to show a few statements now from the media and from very senior people who should, frankly, know an awful lot better. Um, the first one there is, uh, well, you will remember we had a nine-year drought devastating across eastern Australia, Murray-Darling Basin in particular. And they said, well, of course, the drought has not been helped by rising temperatures, which have increased the losses through evaporation. Now, can I say, my, my PhD, okay, I'm in engineering now. My PhD was building land surface evaporation models for global climate models. So I do know a little bit about this. And the reality is, it's completely the wrong way around. When you have a very wet land surface and the sun shines down on it, a lot of the energy goes into evaporating that water. And the remainder goes into heating the air. And so you get lower air temperatures because you've got a very wet land surface. When you have a drought, which by definition means you have very little soil moisture, if, well, let's say you've got none. All of that energy from the sun goes into heating the air temperature. So it's complete confusion of cause and effect. Now, this comment was made by the head of the National Climate Center at the Bureau of Meteorology, who incidentally has never studied evaporation. Um, he also said it's very difficult to make the case that this is simply just a run of bad luck driven by natural cycle, and that a return to more normal rainfall is inevitable, as some would hope. It's very hard to think that. Well, that's only because he's not looked at the climate variability historically. We have decades, multi-decadal, 20, 30-year periods where drought dominates. And do you know what happens after that? And I'm embarrassed to say this to a room of Australians. It takes a flood to break a drought, and we get floods. I'm not looking forward to flying to Brisbane tomorrow, because there's a tropical low coming in. And I wish we had drought. Another comment, this time from, uh, again, uh, someone from the Joint Bureau and CSIRO uh, division. Uh, in the minds of a lot of people, the rainfall that we had in the 50s, 60s, and 70s was a benchmark, but we're just not going to have that sort of good rain as long as the system is warming up. <laughs> now, again, I mentioned Brisbane. Poor old Brisbane. Uh, we had widespread floods, not 18 months after he made that, that statement. And then again, 12 months later in the summer. And this year was meant to be an El Nino year, predicted to be an El Nino year. And I don't know how you feel about it. I'm stuck in Tasmania. It's always wet. But I'm seeing a lot of floods coming in. And like I say, up in Brisbane tomorrow. And uh, Cyclone Lamb, 
I think, about to hit the north up there. So these are senior publicly funded, I should add, people who are speculating. And yet the public, or sections of it, take this as gospel. They fear climate change because the experts tell them to fear it. And I think it is really as, as simple as that. Um, I, was, I was talking to somebody just outside. If, if you're a meteorologist and you make a prediction, you've got a duty, you've got a responsibility to make sure that that is absolutely the best information you can give. And when you get it wrong, you say sorry. I don't know if you remember, I think it was the mid 80s, uh, a British forecaster said that we've had a phone call from Mrs. Cook in Manchester that says, there's a hurricane coming. Well, Mrs. Cook, I can assure you there's no hurricane. Behind this guy's head, there's a bloody hurricane. Pardon my French. <laughs> Pardon my language. There's a town called Seven Oaks. It became Three Oaks. <laughs> a third of all trees in the country fell down. I don't know if you remember the classic show, Allo, Allo. Yes, uh, my wife doesn't like it. I love it. Um, the main actor in that got a tree branch through the head, you know? This was a devastating, New Brighton Baths, the biggest outdoor European pool was washed away. So meteorologists have a responsibility to get it right. If you're a seasonal forecaster and you're making predictions for agriculture, you know that, you, that these people, their livelihoods depend on it. They depend on accurate information. You couch things with uncertainties you give the best information you can, and, uh, and you let the people, the agriculturists, make their decisions thereafter. And if they get it wrong, they get flogged. In climate change, you can speculate whatever you like, and when it's wrong, nothing. They'll go and speculate on the next thing. Tim Flannery, even the rain, no, I, um, I'm actually sorry I've mentioned him now, because I'm gonna be talking for an hour. Even the rain that falls will not be sufficient to, uh, to run off or fill the dams. The dams are full. Well, this kind of intense rainfall is exactly the kind of thing we expect from climate change. The worst, arguably, is the most important. Kevin Trenberth heads up, more or less, the science effort, in inverted commas, with the IPCC. And he wrote a paper a couple of years back called Framing the Climate Debate. Now, I don't know about you, but if, if you're going to write a paper about communicating to people. I wouldn't call it framing. Framing. We've been fitted up. How do we frame them? Um, and, but he actually said, to, to ask what degree climate change influenced this event is actually to ask the wrong question. His way of framing the climate debate is that every event, everything, is influenced by climate change. And then, I think, I'm sure we all remember the angry summer report, which adopted this view and said everything that happened in Australia is caused by climate change. We just don't know by how much, and we don't really care to work it out either. Now, this is the kind of science that some people prefer, where you don't actually have to do anything. You know, that's easy. Um, everything is caused by climate change. So droughts, frankly, are not an indicator of climate change. There was a study published recently pointing out errors in uh, an analysis in the US that claimed that droughts had gone up, but they'd used a model of evaporation that was based on temperature as a proxy. Uh, when they used a physical model of evaporation, they found that there in fact was no trend in 60 years in droughts in the US. Droughts are as bad today in the US as they were 60 years ago. Floods are not an indicator. The 1955 Maitland flood sticks out for me, especially as a, being an ex Wall's End boy from Newcastle. Um, really the last one, it was associated with a strong La Nina. Then they built Wyvernhoe Dam and they did all sorts of things. And the rain we get, blah, blah, blah. And then next minute, 2011, we get a flood just as bad as 1974 and as 1955. And in all those La Nina years, this is actually part of the El Nino, La Nina cycle, and it's coupled with multi-decadal variability, something we call the PDO, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, 
which affects just how much we get hit in these tropical years. So we, I guess the point is you can't judge climate change by droughts, can't judge it by floods. Is it even warming? No? Doesn't look like it, does it? That's put not last 17 years. The numbers are a bit rubbery, depend on your data set. Is it hiding in the ocean? Hiding in the ocean. Um, I was disgusted. There was a Catalyst show not so long ago, and it said the hottest question in climate science, which they've ignored for 16 years, so I don't see how that's the hottest question, has been answered by our friend locally, and I'm just scanning the room to make sure he's not come in a false moustache or anything. Uh, Matthew England at the University of New South Wales. And he says, uh, well, the reason we have a plateau after denying that there was a plateau 18 months earlier on Q&A uh, is because of the PDO. Well, I published on that 15 years ago saying we can expect, perhaps, because of the PDO, uh, a, a plateauing or at least a slowdown in the warming. That's the kind of science I prefer, where you make a prediction and see what happens. What they do is a narrative. It's a story. The models don't work, so they need to find a reason why. So they'll deny the problem until they can think of a narrative, a story. Hiding in the ocean, it's the equivalent. It's the climate science equivalent of the dog ate my homework. <laughs> and it's not based on observation. It's based on a model. And the problem with models is when you build a model, you actually have a model before you actually ever sit down at the computer. It's called a perceptual model. It's you think what's important. You put it into your model, you run your model, and do you know what comes out the other end? Exactly what you thought was going to go in, in the first place. So GCMs don't show that. Uh, his limited model uh, does. So the question is really, how does one test the theory of man-made climate change? If we're interested in science, if we're a science community, how do you actually test the hypothesis? Well, there's actually a very simple way. What is the problem? Let's define the problem. We think the problem might be carbon dioxide increasing in the atmosphere, absorbs long wave radiation, and sends it back down. It's a very simple prospect, really, isn't it? So what do we do? We measure long wave radiation, and let's see if it's increasing. Now, the problem is, well, that's, that's a, let's show a, a slide of the greenhouse effect. We've got the sun's radiation coming in. Some of it is absorbed by carbon dioxide and water vapor, and it's reflected back down. If we're concerned about increasing the greenhouse effect, then we should be able to measure the long wave radiation, and we should see it increasing. Now, you won't see this anywhere else, but NASA have actually done that, and this is their data. This is what they show, and this is no skeptical group. This is no blog site. This is actually a formal part of the World International Climate Research Program. It's part of GWEX, what we call the Global Energy and Water Balance Experiment. On the top there, we've got, in red, the incoming solar radiation. Now, that's affected by things like volcanoes, and we can see Mount Pinatubo, a bit of dip there, around, was it 92? And that's because the volcano puts out dust. It stops the incoming solar radiation. It's also affected by clouds and changes in clouds, and therefore changes in the oceanography. The blue line there, the rather sedate, flat line, is long wave estimates. This is the greenhouse effect. The black line on the bottom is the difference between the two. And what we actually see there, quite clearly, I think, is a bit of a break point around 1999. I'll walk away from the mic and show you. Just about there. And it's not due to this, it's due to that. There's a couple of other things to point, point out with the blue line. There is perhaps, as a stretch of the imagination, a trend upwards. There is a minor trend upwards in long wave radiation down. And that is essentially associated, one would expect, following the consensus with carbon dioxide increases. What you also see is the variability is huge, and it's dictated by major El Nino and La Nina events. The top line up there shows nearly twice the amount of variability. It's the incoming solar radiation governed by changes in albedo, the reflectivity of the planet, 
that creates this trend at the bottom where we have this break in, in around 1999. So if we compare that to the global temperature record, and this is one of them, I forget which possibly guess, um, we can see that the plateauing occurs around 1999 and pretty much in line where the net radiation, the energy balance between short wave coming in and long wave being reflected down shows a mark break around 1999. Let me just state this very clearly. The heat is not hiding in the ocean. It isn't even getting into the planetary system in the first place. It's being bounced back by changes in cloud cover and changes in albedo. So with that, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.